Well, it's now the end of November, and Thanksgiving is over. And by now, after eating turkey for however many days, you might be ready for a hamburger, or a steak, a salad, maybe even a workout. And I've always loved this time of year because for me as a kid, it was a little cooler, the air was cooler, I got to see cousins that would come in from out of town. It was awesome. There were a few days off from school, Thanksgiving and then Christmas. All of this was just good stuff. And there was something different. There was something about Christmas and December and looking forward to this big month because there's no other month like December. And there's something for a kid at least for me, that was special and magical and there was a sense of hope. And if we're honest, when I was really little, I would just hope for a nice loot come December 25th. But I loved all of it. The lights, I loved my my family, I got to see family, I didn't see all of it. And I got to walk through Christmas and this whole December with different characters. You know, there'd be characters all over the map. There'd be Frosty the Snowman, Ebenezer Scrooge, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and Santa. And that one year I lived in Germany, there was a guy named St. Martin who was all about modesty and altruism, and he had a cape. And they marched through the streets, and he had took his cape off and gave it to a homeless guy. All of it is great. And these characters walk with us, and we walk with them. And I had, you know, I knew there was a mystery But each year, as I was really small, I figured out a little bit more of the mystery. I knew that Santa flew all over the world and somehow got Jesus into Bethlehem right at the right time and that Jesus would go to my house and there'd be gifts. And Jesus had a pet named Rudolph. (coughs) And I, I I made it happen. And my parents, I think, looked forward to what I would say next because I would always conflate our Christmas and our holidays, and I would, I mean, I thought I had figured out this great mystery, and it's okay. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and as we begin, we were beginning the church year, so we're, start, we're going back to the starting line again, and we get to do this over and over each year. We go back to the very beginning. We light candles on the wreath. We've changed our colors to blue. It could have been purple also, but we go from green to blue at our church. And we, we go back to this initial hope, the hope for something good to come, an expectation for something significant in our lives. Advent's all about hope and expectation, but it's hope based on a promise rather than hope based on lights and gifts and an emotion. It's based on a promise a promise that will change your life. That's what hope's about. Now, it, we enter a time of Advent with waiting, and we have to ask the question, what are we waiting for? What were they waiting for in the, in the, very, the very beginning? And the New Testament begins with the Old Testament expectation of the coming of a Messiah. And for thousands of years, Israel had been waiting, waiting for a king to save the people and restore their relationship to God. And prophets had talked about the coming. And everybody was pointing into the future about what was to come. There was great expectation and hope for the coming of the Messiah. And people had different ideas about what that would be. But Jesus' birth meant that the waiting was over. And as we begin our season of Advent together, we are meant to relive with anticipation the arrival of God incarnate, God with skin on, that very first time in Bethlehem the beginning of His reign, and we're also meant to anticipate His second coming, His return, and the fullness of glory. And our gospel reading reminds us a little bit of that today. And as we make our way towards Christmas, unlike what I did as a kid walking with the characters of Frosty, we've decided to do a little sermon series where we're going to walk with different characters, although Frosty and Rudolph are good. We've decided to walk with characters of our Christmas story. And today we're going to begin with the angels. 
And then after this week, we're going to go on to John the Baptist, and then with Mary, and finally with Joseph, so that we arrive with Christmas, at Christmas, having seen a perspective that we may not have considered before. So why do we start with angels? Why even look at angels? Back when Billy Graham did a sermon on angels years and years ago, he said, you know, I've never even heard anybody give a sermon about angels. And if you look through the sermon, sermon books, that's, angel sermons are not very popular. So we might want to ask the question, why? why what's the, what is the deal? Well, first of all, they're important. They're an integral part of the Christian faith. Starting in the very beginning, uh, up to the very end with Jesus' ascension. You can look at 2,000 some odd year, years later after Jesus' life, you still see angels in movies and in books and in films. They're atop of the great cathedrals from the medieval days. They're looking down. They're in the arts. And it's funny because a lot of people who don't even believe in the possibility of God coming down in flesh they can have no intention of believing in a God. But they'll believe in angels. And they'll say things like, I have a guardian angel. Or I've got an angel who watches out for me. It's fascinating. Because where do we get these ideas? We get them from Scripture. It's interesting. So I would say this. Let's begin with the angels. And let's see what, what we, we're going to look at. Where do we find them in Scripture? Why does it matter? And what does it have to say to us as we walk with these characters towards that manger all over again? Well, first of all, the Scriptures tell us that angels are real, that they exist. This isn't something that we've, over the centuries, have concocted like a, a tradition. The Scriptures tell us that they're real. They're mentioned in Scripture nearly 300 times. And throughout the ages, we have heard over and over, the, there's a witness of the church that in some way or another has experienced the reality of angels. And so if you believe in the scriptures, you have to say, well, then I believe that there are angels. But what are they? What are they like? Well, first of all, their nature is a spiritual nature. They're supernatural beings created by God that the letter of the Hebrews describes as spirits. And the more you read about angels and what they do and their role in the, in the overarching story, you'll see that their nature and their characteristics become a little more clear. They're like humans so often that they're sometimes referred to as men. But they're different enough to evoke fear and even worship sometimes from humans. They're not male or female. They're asexual in their nature. And their knowledge is more comprehensive than humans, but it is limited. Now, they're, according to the scriptures, they're stronger, physically stronger, a lot stronger than humans. They possess their own language, and they carry out the tasks with the primary focus of caring about the salvation of humans. This is all straight from the scriptures. So where are they now? And why don't we see them like we imagine them? Well, we, I think, have attached this idea of what an angel looks like with wings because they're said to be from the heavens. There's nothing in the scriptures that actually say that they're winged like the stained glass and everything else uh, seems to indicate. It says there are myriads and legions of them. They're referenced in scripture in large groups. There are even, of course, archangels in our church 2,000 years later sits here because of an archangel, a warrior named Michael, that we find in the scriptures. The other archangel is Gabriel, the messenger that we are familiar with this time of year. Their primary purpose is carrying out God's orders. As the name of their office implies, they're messengers. They do things like announce births. They give reassurances. They commission a person to do different tasks. They communicate God's words to the prophets. They change or guide a person's actions, and they work as God's agent, even in punishment, too. So where do we find them in the Bible? Let's start with the very beginning. Back in Genesis, they, when, when Genesis was closed, they are the ones that closed the doors on paradise, uh, of paradise. They protected Lot. They saved Hagar and her child. They met with Abraham. They communicated 
the law by their ministry. They led the people of God. They announced births and callings. They helped the prophets. And finally, the angel Gabriel announced the birth of the precursor John the Baptist and that of Jesus himself. That's sort of the ultimate angel moment in all of history, announcing the birth of Jesus. And then in Jesus' life, his life and ministry, we see angels all the time. From the incarnation to the ascension, the life of Jesus is surrounded by the angels, adoring him, the service to him. When God brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And from Hebrews 1.6. Their song of praise at the birth of Christ has not stopped with the resounding of glory to God in the highest. We say that in our liturgy. The idea of angels has come into our songs and our hymns when we celebrate the, the, the Eucharist, when we have a burial rite. Angels, the, the role of angels in our scriptures is, is really powerful. When, you're, when we do services, um, funeral services, the role of angels is to take those who have died and walk them to the gates of heaven. So my question is, how do you imagine angels now? What experiences, if any, have you had? I haven't really had any. But man, you can read lots of books where people have sort of taken their experiences. There are countless, countless uh, stories about missionaries. There's one in, in China in the early part of the century there where there was a... Um, Attack was going to be a made, an attack was going to be made on this, this orphanage. And everybody was inside. They knew that they were going to be attacked by this group of bandits. And the head of the uh, orphanage was sick. And all she could do was muster up the strength to say, Lord, protect us. Protect your children. Protect those of us who believe in you. And so they knew that the marauders were coming and they never attacked. And later, you know, they, they were, of course, praying through the night. And later they, they said, what, what, why didn't we get attacked? And they, they asked someone who had been outside and they said, I can't tell you why they chose not to attack you, but I can tell you what I saw. There were, some, there were, there were uniformed men in white who were guarding the orphanage. Who are they? He said, I don't know. And there are countless stories like this where People come away from that experience saying, you know, angels do exist. And from time to time, they even today make their presence known. I would say, as we walk towards the manger, the thing I think about when I think of angels is, number one, they've always been around. They've always been on the lookout. They've always looked forward to the birth of Christ. They've, they announced it. They went out of their way. And then when he was born, we look at their example where they totally rejoiced at the top of their lungs. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Now, I know a couple weeks ago I gave a sermon about Johnny Cash. <laughs> and I have to say there's one of the most powerful lines in anything he, he ever wrote was in the song, when he, the song called When the Man Comes Around. So it talks about the end times. And the line that I could do a whole sermon on is the moment when they see the Lord in Revelation. And see, Johnny's put, put this all together for, for himself. A hundred million angels singing to the beat of a kettle drum. A hundred million angels singing. The whole host of heaven... If this is real, and as Christians we actually believe that it is, it paints us a picture of power, of goodness, a picture of hope. So that by the time we walk with the angels in the story to the very beginning where Jesus was born, we have a sense that he was never alone. We know that. We know that the angels tended to him in the desert later on. We know that he was comforted in the Garden of Eden before the night before he died. He was comforted by the angels. 
If we allow that real story to really come into our lives, imagine the perspective we'll have. Because the angels, of course, love Jesus, but they're also here for all of us. They're not to be worshipped, of course, but if they're real, I think of the scriptures that says, be alert. Not only should we be alert about the second coming of Christ, but be alert. Because in Hebrews, we, we read, we'll entertain angels and not even know it. They may not have wings like we imagine. They may be sitting next to you on... In the, or standing next to you in the elevator. So as we begin this, this journey with the, the different characters of Advent, this idea of hope and expectation, my prayer for us is, as we walk with the different characters, with the angels and with Mary and Joseph, that by the time we get to that first birth again, our hearts can... Fill, fill up a little bit more with the reality of the love that God has for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful for your truth and that as we start Advent, we can remember that your love for us is so huge that you decided to come in the form of your Son. Allow us to prepare for that by walking through this story with a different perspective than we've had before. We're grateful for your angels that you've sent them to be caretakers and to watch for us and to look out and to tend to us. Lord, help us to open our hearts to these truths and mold us in your image over and over again. In Christ's name, amen.